Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Can you hear me in the back okay? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, this here is a, a Time Magazine post from 1969. Who here remembers this one? Don't, 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 don't need to answer. <laughs> so, uh, the question, is God dead? Um, is not really an original question that Time Magazine asked. Uh, it was more of a reflection from about a century earlier with uh, Frederick Nietzsche, who asked uh, the question basically, is God dead? But more of so that, not, not that God is dead, but that humans have killed him. And that uh, eventually we've killed him off and that we have uh, removed any meaning of life and what he calls nihilism after that. But this topic was revived again in Time Magazine uh, issue and it explored this topic, whether religion has a future in the world. Is, it, is religion simply going to be on decline because of the technologies and advances in society? Is religion just going to be something that will have been removed out, outside of uh, public life? And for many, for many decades after this, many people would probably uh, believe this to be true. But uh, based on the newest statistics that have been released um, out from the Pew Research polls and other institutions, um, we're going to really kind of examine this question whether religion is really on the decline or is increasing. And one of the reasons I think this talk is relevant is we had a discussion just this Friday about having a new Islamic center. So, and there's questions about, you know, who's gonna be coming? Are we gonna have enough people to, to be at this place? Um, what's the future of things? And I think a lot of statistics will help answer some of these questions uh, about the utility of that. Uh, if you look at a lot of the hadith and the verses of the Quran, you would make it would make you sound like uh, religion is going to be something that will be on the sharp decline towards the end of times. And there's hadith from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that there will come a time when holding on to religion will be like holding on to hot coal. And when I read statements like this, it makes me feel like religion will be antagonized so much and will be such that uh, being a believer would be a strange thing. And so it's with a lot of good reason that maybe we would think that religion is on the decline. So I, I have a series of statistics and things like that. I'm going to kind of take you guys through it. And this is from the Pew Research uh, Center. And this was uh, the, all these statistics were from 2015. And what it's doing is it's projecting from that year till 2050, five zero. And it's gonna talk about what are we expecting the population of certain religious groups to be over that period of time. And with the exception of Buddhists, which is, is essentially staying the same, every single religious group is expected to sharply increase over the next 35 years. 40 years and if you look here Muslims are projected to increase pretty sharply in terms of billions 1.6 billion to 2.76 billion and it will Islam is projected to grow faster than any other major religion in the world if you look here this is unaffiliated which would correspond to atheists agnostics or people without any religious affiliation and you see that there's only a very, very small increase from 1.13 billion to 1.23 billion. You have to realize a lot of these people are located in Asia, China, and other Asian countries. And so the unaffiliated population is supposed to increase only 10% in the decades ahead. And so based on these analysis, we're seeing that Percentages are going to be increasing among all religious groups. Among the, among the specific religious groups themselves, Muslims are expected to increase sharply. Christians are about to stay the same. Unaffiliated will actually decrease. Sorry, what did the second column mean? 
This is the percentage of the global, global population. These are just the raw numbers. So even though the unaffiliated group will increase by 10%, in the global scheme, they will actually decrease by 3%. So there will be fewer atheists and agnostics percentage-wise in the world in the, in the next four decades. We're gonna go through some more statistics and I, and I hope this will become more clear. So a lot of times we talk about uh, population dynamics in terms of replacement level and birth rates. And so uh, among the more developed societies, the birth rates are much lower. You see the nuclear family in the United States, you see you know, a boy and a girl and you have four, usually four person family. Whereas you go to places like the Middle East and Africa, you see much larger families. And according to statistics, uh, on average, there has to be about 2.1 children per uh, family or per woman, I guess you could say, for it to be considered a replacement level for the population to not decrease. And we see here that uh, among most religious groups, including Jews, Hindus, and Christians, they're well above the um, replacement level. But we're seeing the religions that are actually um, tend to be atheist or tend to be kind of what you would consider the uh, folk religions or things like that, other religions, which would be your smaller religions, are all below the repl replacement level. And so the unaffiliated group, atheist, agnostic, are, are reproducing at a rate below the replacement level. And so um, just from, from a birth standpoint, they're all not able to keep up. You see here, sharply, Muslims are 3.1, which is far higher than uh, 2.1. And so in 2006, uh, we see that the Muslim countries have an average population growth of 1.8% per year, while the world population growth is 1.1%. And we're seeing here that uh, the estimated population change in the population size among Muslims is supposed to be by far the, the highest. And then you see the Christians and Hindus are basically very close to the replacement uh, rate. So among all religions, really Muslims are the ones that are really continuing to grow uh, in, in the uh, years to come. But it goes more than that. The Muslim population is only gonna be getting younger. And among the expected uh, percentages of Muslims under the age of 15 is 34%. So by 2050, 34% of the Muslims are gonna be under the age of 15. 15, one five. And you're gonna see a very small amount of the elderly population. Only 7% are gonna be over the age of 60. And then you have about 60% within this 50, 15 to 59 range. Whereas you look at populations like the Jews, the youth and the old people are almost the same. Whereas Muslims you have about five times as many younger people to old people. We should keep these trends in mind when we're thinking about who's gonna be at the centers. So these are just a few other interesting projections that in about 20, by the year 2050, the number of Muslims will be nearly equal to the number of Christians in the world. In Europe, Muslims will make up about 10% of the overall population. In India, the Hindu majority will be retained, but India will also have the largest Muslim population of any country in the world, surpassing Indonesia. And in the United States, Muslims will be the most numerous in the US than any people who identify as Jewish other, I think I said that wrong. Muslims will be more numerous in the US than people who identify as Jewish on the basis of religion. So to put more simply, that means Islam will be the second largest religion in the United States. And so we're seeing here the long-term projections of Christians at 2050 was roughly about the same. But by the year 2070, we're actually gonna start seeing a shift where Muslims will become the largest population in the world. This was kind of said interestingly by the director of the Pew Research Foundation, where he says another way of thinking about it is that Christianity had a seventh century head start on Islam, and Islam is finally catching up. This is a very important slide, and I really want you guys to, to lock in on this one. So, 
we talk about religious switching as sort of a way of tracking conversions. And we're actually seeing that the net change for conversions is going to be highest towards the unaffiliated group. Meaning that approximately there will be 60 or so million people who will change over into the unaffiliated group. So what, where are these unaffiliated people coming from? Almost entirely from the Christians. Now, I think a lot of this, you know, some people may be quick to jump and say, well, it means just Christianity is not a very good religion, so people are getting out of it. But I think the, the best explanation is that Christians, or a lot of them, are living in the West. So I would imagine that a lot of these rates are going to be similar for Muslims in the West. But if you look globally, the, the Muslim rate is actually going to be increasing about by about 3 million overall. But you have to imagine that maybe as things in the Middle East change or other things like that, that may not be retained. And so I think one of the big takeaways here is that for those living in the West, there is a huge shift towards the changing between unaffiliated religions or atheists. And you see 66 million people uh, uh, will have converted out of Christianity over this 40-year uh, period of time. 60 million people. Wow. And so you're seeing here very few religions are really uh, doing very well in this area. Islam is the only major religion projected to have really a substantial increase. And this is not what I would really call substantial either. And keep in mind here, there's still 9.4 million people who are leaving the religion. We're also seeing that countries over this period of time will start to actually lose the majority status. And then Australia... Christians will no longer be the majority. And in fact, in some countries like France, atheists or agnostic will be the majority. And so we're seeing over this period of time, uh, there's, there, there's projected to be a lot of shifts in the religious uh, climate that um, can, can take a lot of countries. I mean, to think that the United Kingdom would have a minority Christian population is pretty staggering considering the, the history of that country. But think about it in this way, even though we, we talked about earlier that Muslims were supposed to be the second largest religion in the country by 2050, that's a very small sliver. Notice what the, the highest rising group is. It's unaffiliated. And so about almost a 9% rise over 40, 40 uh, years is this unaffiliated group, almost exclusively taken out of the Christians. But you have to imagine that Muslims are not immune to that. A lot of these increases really from immigration and birth rate, not because of people switching to Islam. And so there's a, a huge shift here. This is a very steep curve or steep line right here between people who are increasingly become un unaffiliated, 25%. And keep in mind in other countries in Europe, this is already up here. And it's really no surprise because if you look over the last 10 or 20 years, there has been a lot of literature uh, about atheism that has really become quite popular. And all of these books are ones that I knew about growing up, and I knew people who were in my school were reading them and they were talking about them. And if you go on YouTube or any blog, all the talking points from these books will be present. And I would rather to say that most of the time, there aren't very good answers in the community for these kind of questions. And I think a lot of the arguments on here and I've read some of the material in these books are really quite weak, but the delivery of these messages are very powerful. And it's something to realize that within the United States, these books are becoming very popular. I wanna close by um, talking a little bit about uh, how it relates to kind of what we think about in terms of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam and so in some ways we always think about how the, the world is going to change in a different way when the Imam comes. And there are verses in the Quran that seem to allude to this, where it says, It is he who has sent the messenger with guidance in the religion of truth to proclaim it over all religion, even though the pagans may detest it. And even though this verse applied pretty pretty well to the past, 
we have a lot of uh, scholars believe that this applies for the future of the imam. And so I wanted to play a little clip, if it works, here, only a few minutes, uh, pertaining to this verse and why, I, uh, kind of the explanation for it. So we'll see if this works. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so this is one of those prophecies in which the Quran says that Allah has sent his messenger with this religion of truth so that it may prevail over all other religions. Now, before we go further, it is important that I mention and clarify a little bit what Islam and the Quran refers to when it says that this religion may prevail over all other religions because I am very cognizant of the fact that these lectures tend to somehow make their way to the internet and a lot of times they're not just heard by Muslims but even by non-Muslims, by Jews, by Christians and others and it can very easily lend itself to the idea that Islam has a militant agenda to essentially wipe out all other uh, religions and to basically force everyone into a submission or kill them uh, and unfortunately, this sort of an agenda tends to be uh, um, vocalized by some uh, militant and fundamentalist groups who call themselves Muslims, but we do not subscribe to that belief. So it is important to clarify here that when the Quran talks of deen and when it talks of Islam, it generally understands the religion of God to be only one. In the deen in the law, Islam. But this Islam is not a proprietary form of religion where the Jews say our religion is based on the Torah and we are the followers of Moses and our religion is Christianity and we are the followers of Jesus and we follow the Bible and you Muslims follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and your book is the Quran and so on. And this sort of thinking in itself is flawed um, and it has given rise to even individuals who promote a, a, a pluralistic idea of religion to say that all religions are correct and all religions are fine and lead to God. Essentially the Quran's message is that there is only one religion with God. These messengers are not to bring different paths to you. They all bring the one path, which is the path of Tawheed, the path of monotheism, the idea that there is only one God to be worshipped besides whom there is none. So when the Quran says that he, it is God who sent his messenger with guidance and with the religion of truth, so that it may prevail over all other religions, the idea here is that this religion is meant to realign any uh, false ideas that may have entered that one original religion that Adam, peace be on him, came with, the same religion that Noah came with, the same religion that Ibrahim came with. It was the same thing that Dawood and Sulaiman and Musa and Zakaria and Yahya came with the same idea. That was Islam as well. In other words, that religion which will prevail will not be to say that the other religions um, have to be eliminated. It simply means they have to come to an agreement of one truth and remove any misconceptions and wrong ideas in them. And as we shall see in our discussion, that with the coming of the Imam and with this prophecy being fulfilled, a large number of individuals from other faiths will not be fought against and killed, but rather will change their views and submit to that one religion, to that one Islam that was always the religion that God had planned for mankind. So in essence, there is only one truth and one religion, and that religion is one of complete submission to Allah. That is the religion of Tawheed, and that is the deen al-haq that Allah is talking about. The second point to keep in mind is that last year, 
I also had the. So I, I, I just felt like that clip was pretty interesting because um, we always talk about that verse and how religion will change, but I think it's important to the point that he made was that um, it's you kind of just have to boil it down to those essential truths, and that will become the what the world will uh, essentially converge upon, rather than a specific doctrine or or what have you. This is kind of a, a verse to kind of or a, a quote from this same gentleman that we talked about earlier. And it says, we're not saying that this will happen if its current patterns and trends continue. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. There could be war, revolution, famine, disease. These are things that no one can predict and that could change the numbers. So I take this kind of a reminder that um, the Pew Research Foundation hasn't really taken into account the return of the imam into their project projections and a lot can change as well. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that um, these projections are not uh, 100%. So I just wanted to take some, there are some takeaways from these numbers, besides just, just being sort of interesting, that I think are kind of useful for us moving forward, is that religion is not going anywhere in terms of its presence. It's only continuing to grow, especially the adherence uh, of religion. Uh, the adherence of religion is projected to increase. But we also have to realize that non-religion is the fastest growing category in the United States. Um, and so we have to be very cognizant of the fact that this trend exists in this country and that it, it's really present. I mean, I can speak to myself growing up in, in public school here and interacting with people. I interacted with many people who uh, claim to be atheists or people who had very high atheist leanings. And a lot of them are honestly more educated than the religious people about um, many of these issues. And so um, one of the takeaways that I have, you know, kind of at the end here is that uh, I think educating ourselves about the fundamentals of the religion are really critical because a lot of religious people uh, don't really have this, in my opinion. Um, and they're not really used to their beliefs being questioned. And when they are questioned by people who are outside of their community, it's very difficult for them to uh, answer them. And if it's not talked about in the community, they can feel shy to bring it up because it can make you, it makes you feel uncomfortable to raise doubts about religion in your community. People will look at you funny and act like there is something wrong with you or that you're, you're just not, you're, you have a weak faith deficiency of some sort. And honestly, there is probably some people who are just scared because if they ask the question in their community and they don't get an answer, but then what do they do? So sometimes they may just pretend like it doesn't exist, but it may bother them on the inside. The other thing to realize is that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States and will be the second largest religion within a few decades. And so when we're talking about building an Islamic center, um, I think there is reason to believe that there are gonna be more people coming, that there are gonna be a lot of young people who are gonna be populating it, and there's gonna be a lot of diversity within those people because a lot of the regions that have the highest birth rates like Southeast Asia and Africa are producing a lot of Muslims. And we should expect that these people will be ending up in, these, in our communities as well. And because of the fact that a lot of these people are gonna be young, I think it's important for us to focus on developing programs for the youth so that they're included at an early age um, in the communities because there's gonna be a large number of them and um, overall, I think that this, these numbers have a huge, can have a huge uh, help in our direction moving forward as a community in terms of the things we need to focus on. And so that's all I have right now. Um, salam, salam, Muhammad, wa Muhammad.